with theory and practice, and of course, the DABDA model of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. How does that present that theory in our practice rooms? Well, I think before I, before I go on to, to analyse that, I think I'd like to say it's one of the most enduring pieces of theory that, that is around not only the counselling profession, but also the helping professions in general. I think that anybody who's a, a helper, be they a therapist, a support worker, a, anybody who helps people in any way has probably come across the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a Swiss American a psychiatrist who has a, a really interesting backstory. She was a she was a cleaner, and then she met someone who helped her become a psychiatrist, which I think is a fantastic story. And she she developed through her observations of people who were dying in the process of dying, people of terminal illnesses, um, how they reacted. And one of the very interesting things about this is she didn't actually. Um, research them as stuff. They they weren't research participants. She, she it was more observational, and more she would talk to them, and she she saw some patterns of behaviour, and she she called this uh, the grieving process, and she wrote a book in 1969 called On Death and Dying, and from that book we get the acronym DABDA, and it said that people go through a in terms of loss, um, a a kind of pattern of experiencing. And that is, is denial. So DABDA is denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. And the the model would, would suggest on face value that people go through this in, in, in an order. People, first of all, deny there's anything wrong. And then once that, that that's kind of resolved and they realize there is something wrong, they become angry about it. And then they're, they're bargaining. This third stage is all about, you know, if I do this, if I do that, will things change? And then depression, you know, the realisation that, you know, life is is ending. And then eventually acceptance. And I think sometimes this model gets a bit misrepresented, Ken, because it's always presented in a linear format. In other words, it starts with denial and finishes with acceptance. The truth of the matter is is that many, many people who experience grief may have those um, presenting uh, issues, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, um, in different orders or altogether or miss some of them out. Um, but it is a very useful um, kind of kind of theory to, to, to gain an understanding of how people may react to something as, you know, as, as tragic as, as terminal illness. Yeah, a good, good topic that you've brought. And I love this little piece of theory, Rory. And what's interesting, and of course, this was, this was um, written in regards to that terminal illness, but mm. it is so adaptable to the grieving process as a whole. So it can be the loss of somebody else. It can be the loss of a pet. That's the thing we can see that you, even the loss of, of, of something like a car, you know, we might yeah. see this process playing out. So there's something very human about the different stages that uh, were identified here that we do go through. And I think really smart pointing out, Rory, is that you're not sat there with this number line wait saying, right, so they're in denial now. So next time I see them, then we're going to see the anger, yeah. then we're going to go into the old bargaining stage. It can it can. As you say, you can you can have uh, two or more of them at the same time in a way, or miss things out, and and they don't necessarily run in an order, but they are something to kind of peg where somebody might be at, and to understand it from a human perspective. And I'm going to start with that first, the denial, uh, and I'm going to go. I'm going to use a car, a car, uh, this the, the well loved car that is parked downstairs, and then you get up the next morning and you go downstairs and you look, and and, and the car's gone, Rory. Oh gosh! The first step, the first, the denial is, where did I park it? It can't be gone. Yeah. I know I locked it. I know I locked it, so it can't be gone. Has somebody else used it? Has somebody turned up? Did I park it in a different place? Am I remembering correctly here? And there's this, I can't believe it element to it, um, within that 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 moment. Then the person might go on to the bargaining and go, well, I can now truly see it's gone because I can see some broken glass where my parking spot was. Now, I wonder had I, if I'd have only bought that steering lock 
My wife was on at me for how many years to get that steering lock? <laughs> oh, I should have put that alarm in. If I'd have put that alarm in, that wouldn't have happened. And that's into the bargaining stage. And that is retrospective bargaining, where you're going into the past saying, if I'd have done things differently, then maybe this wouldn't have happened right now. And and then, of course, the depression, my car's gone. What am I going to do? Uh, I can't live without my car. I don't know how I'm going to get around. Uh, but of course, life goes on and, and we live on and we make our way through that. And then the acceptance that one day you sat in a pub, Rory, telling somebody the story about the day that your car got stolen. Uh, and yeah. you may be removed from the, the 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 spikiness of the emotions that you felt within that moment. I've, I've taken a very glib example, uh, not related to, to people and, and uh, rather put it on a car, but that's kind of maybe an overview of that Dabda model playing out. Yeah, absolutely, Ken. And I think you've, I think you've hit on an interesting point there. One of the reasons Dabda is presented in the way it is, in a linear form, is, is because it's, it's probably the easiest um, theory of loss that can be taught to a wide range of professionals. In fact, if you if you drill down into the work of Kubler Ross, and bearing in mind, um, you know she, she was a she was a proper researcher. The person who wrote the forward to a book was Colin Murray Parks, who was a you know who, who is a huge um, influence in studies of loss and grief. So. You know, the, this wasn't just a very short book that said Dabda, and then at the end had some references in. Yeah. There was quite there was there was a lot to it, and also, I think it's worth pointing out that her her um, observations were p- for people who were dying. So sometimes that model doesn't transpose to people who have lost. Ah. Yes. Um, I, I think I think I think that's that's something that needs to be said, and it has been adapted through the through the years through the years her work has been adapted and modified rather like maslow's hierarchy of needs it, it's been adapted and in fact if you go to um our mother website counselingtutor.com, look for podcast episode 249 we'll put a link to um elizabeth kubler-ross's the, the late elizabeth kubler-ross's website and you can see how it's been adapted but it, it remains can an enduring theory yeah. of how to work with grief and loss. And um, I think I think it's one that can be taught quite quickly for those people who've never encountered how to work with clients, just to have that little acronym in the back of your mind, I think is really helpful. Yeah. And for me, there's also an, a, a normalizing element in in these stages. And, and I'm going to go back to what I was saying, how if there's anything that stands out in these stages is how human they are and how how these kind of feelings or emotions show themselves in in different stages of our lives and sometimes and when i speak about normalizing sometimes you may be working with a client who has lost somebody very dear to themselves it could be a a partner or, or somebody really close and they lose that person and they might come into therapy and they might be quite angry that that person is no longer around. Now they love that person dearly. They're experiencing such grief at the loss of that person. But within them, there's also this, how can, how can he leave me now? How can he go now? How can, and that for that client presenting, and this is what this is about. How does that theory represent itself in practice? It can be hard for them. That can be unacceptable to them. How can I feel this anger towards this person that I've just lost and yeah. that I loved so much? And there's we, we can go to the normalizing where we can explain that this is natural. This is a natural ex- experience to be having when, when faced with, with a loss like this. And it can normalize that and maybe give that person a little bit of resolve that it's okay to feel that yeah. anger intermingled in with all of that grief and sadness. Absolutely, Ken. And I, I think that, you know, we talk about psychological education a lot and people people see that in terms of in the frame of trauma, which, of course, you know, grief is a, a form of trauma. But I, I think sometimes just to maybe step out of the person centred pantheon mm. of non directedness and just share that information. I've always been a great believer in information that is going to be helpful to the client. We should share. You know, as long as as long as there's no agenda to it, and you know, many times I've shared that in practice and said, you know, and, and sometimes you do you write can clients will say, why do I feel this way? Mm. You know, why 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 do I hate this person so much for for leaving me? 
and and that that brings up anxiety and 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 fear and um, shame and all those emotions that are attached to it, and just simply just saying, well, look, you know, this is a this is a process that humans go through. It's been known for a long, long time, and you know, not to put too fine a point on it. Look, you're not going crazy. This is just a natural yeah. progression of grief, and and that can be just so helpful. You're just disabusing them of the of the the pressure they're putting themselves on, and you know, if that's not our work, I don't know what is, Ken. Oh, yeah. Well said, Rory. Here, here, I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, another area of this this um, model, I guess, that is interesting to me is the bargaining uh, mm. stage. That if I hadn't, if I had, if I didn't do that, if it had gone like this, that if I only listened to, if I'd have read that, if we'd have taken these or whatever that bargaining may be. Mm. And we may, we may recognize that a client can get stuck there even many years after the loss, that it's a sticky place, the bargaining. Uh, it's almost a that uh, uh, there can be an accepting of if I had acted differently, then then this may have played out very very differently, and that I think is 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 a when we recognise that a client may be in that bargaining phase and being in that bargaining phase for some time, I think there's the 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 patience element of being with them. Yeah, that. and within the bargaining there is an incongruence, and and the incongruence for me, I'm speaking specifically about loss now. So I'll speak about the loss of the car. If I hadn't parked it over there, if I had bought that alarm system, if I'd have put a steering lock on, then this wouldn't have happened. But the truth of the matter is, it did happen. So yeah. there is an incongruence in looking back to it may not have happened, and maybe in a person centered way, you you can you can point to the incongruence when the time is right, when the relationship is built up right, saying, I recognize that you you really feel that if you'd have done those things in the past differently, then maybe it would have played out differently. But of course, you now find yourself here and pointing again to how it really is, what it's like right now, bringing them into the here and now, but recognizing the, the emotions of the there and then, the bargaining, if I had, if I hadn't, if we had, whatever that may be, that's a sticky place to be. And I think patience there, Rory, is uh, just patience and understanding, care and empathy. Uh, I, to I totally agree. And uh, and also, you know, don't be surprised if if this kind of presentation of grief comes up many, 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 many years after someone has died. Um, because it can be, it can be kind of uh, cyclic. That's the word I'm looking for. It could be cyclic. So things like on anniversaries, things like on birthdays, you know, um, you know, Christmas, the Christmas holidays, as we call them now. All those, all those things can trigger that kind of cycle, and it can, it can, it can trigger individual bits of the Dabda cycle. So you might get a client you're working with, and all of a sudden they come in just incredibly angry one day. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you you know, you say I noticed that you, you seem really angry, and it might be that you know that, that's the that is the the symptom, if you like, of the fact that there's a special day. It could be a birthday, it could be a holiday. That person isn't there, and they they're just very angry about it that they've 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 left them. And you know, and in fact, thinking back through practice, Ken, I can I can think of you know a number of occasions where I've worked with clients. And they're angry the person actually died. Yeah. They're angry the person actually died. And it's real anger. And, you know, as Ken has often said, and I love Ken's phrase, all feelings are welcome in the therapy room. All feelings should be engaged with. And, you know, maybe you have to engage with that. It feels a little bit counterintuitive that you are angry at someone dying. But actually, that's the process, part of the process of letting go. And for some people, it can be a lifelong endeavor. Some people kind of move on and they, they move away. Other people may very well just have this cyclic um, re, uh, revisiting of the of the difficulties and the, the pain of loss. And others may, you know, quite frankly, not escape it at all. That might be a permanent position for them. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can definitely get stuck there. And I, I think to circle right back to where we began with this before we give you the special secret link to go and get Rory's <laughs> super duper handout on the Dabda model, then you can have it in, in, in your hand and you can look over that yourself. And, and that is that this is not linear and that it can go forward and backwards. So you, you can have an example where a client will be 
will have acceptance that the person is gone. And I, I, I'm speaking from my own personal uh, journey here, looking back over uh, the Christmas period, I, I lost my dad uh, over that time. And every time we come to that uh, time of year, um, I, I, I maybe feel myself getting slightly depressed, revisiting that depression uh, stage of things, even though I have the acceptance and I've had the acceptance now for decades, but I still go back there at this time of year. And you, you mentioned it there, Rory, the little triggers that might be there. It might be a birthday, it might be an anniversary, it might be a festive yeah. uh, holiday where you might think back on that person. And you can very much move from acceptance to an, a, another stage. Uh, it's it's a good model. It's a, it's worth having. It's not the be all and end all. And I wouldn't suggest if you are working with grief that this is your only model that you would work with. I would expand your your horizons on that. But it's certainly worth having, as you said, Rory. Simple to understand. Simple to, to teach somebody else. The Dabda model. Elizabeth Kubler asks, where can you get it? Go to counselingtutor.com. Uh, that's on my other website. Click on the podcast tab because that's what you're listening to. Find episode two four nine right there on that page you can download rory's super duper handout <laughs> it's a super duper handout. it's right there for you and there it is that is today's theory in practice
big thank you to Alan, a big thank you to you, Rory, for reaching out and, and holding that really interesting uh, interview. It's, uh, uh, I, I'd like to read the book. I haven't read the book. I would like to read the book. I'll certainly be looking at the show notes page, counselingtutor.com, uh, podcast tab, episode 249, to have a look for the link to the book. Uh, that is uh, Alan Fratt on the topic of waking dreams and i do believe rory this is a, there's a bit of a rumor here i'm gonna to have to go for you for confirmation on this rumor that alan may be in the pipeline for making a lecture for the counselor cpd library so that's worth looking out for uh, absolutely absolutely we um we were so impressed with what what he had to say yeah. that we invited him to to do a lecture and he's, he's going to be scheduled in as one of our lectures and i i mean having, having started to read the book yeah, I don't think this is a lecture to be missed once we once we produce it. Yeah? Nice yeah. one. And if you're not a member of the Counselor CPD Library, it's so easy to join. You just go to counsellingtutor.com and the information is right there on the screen. An annual membership to the Counselor CPD Library will cost you less than the price of one cup of coffee per month out with a friend. So it really is worth it. It's absolutely jam-packed full of quality CPD uh, all with learning objectives, all certified. Uh, so go and check that out, counsellingtutor.com. This has been episode 249 of the Counselling Tutor Podcast. Yes, we started with theory and practice, stages of grieving. We looked at the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the enduring piece of theory that um, that has helped so many. And we looked at it in a little bit more detail and hope that is of help to you if you ever need to use that theory with your clients. Practice today is a new section. We're looking at contemporary issues in counselling. And Ken and myself talked about using translators in the therapy room, something that is really is a contemporary issue in the society that we find ourselves in. And then finally, in Practice Matters, I caught up with Alan Fratt, who talked about waking dreams in psychotherapy, an interesting direction taken in in a in a new idea of how people interact with the world and as always stay grounded and stay safe <laughs>